on the social. The Olympic medalist who skated into the history books and captivated the world. Tessa Virtue joins the social as our celebrity co-host. Co this often uh, welcoming here Olympic gold medalist and half of the most decorated ice dancing duo in the world the one and only Tessa Virtue is here <laughs> Best. Fun to sit at the desk. Yeah, so we're going to mix it up a little. Are you ready to do that with ready. us, Tessa? Bring it on. We're going to do that. And as you know, Marcy is away today, uh, but we've got a lot to get to, so we want to hear from you right now in real time. Share your opinions on social media. We've got all of the outlets open for business. Has festival style gone too far? Yes. Has it? Yes. Okay. I'm talking about Coachella, in case your Instagram feed, you're wondering what the heck is happening on Insta. <laughs> it is in full swing, and that means social media is overrun with all of Coachella fashions like these. Uh, these over-the-top creations worn by festival goers is what you're seeing. Celebrities also synonymous with the festival. And every year, it seems to get wilder and wilder. And of course, uh, none other than Rihanna also stepping into the mix with outfits like this. So is this just entertainment, or are you actually looking to any of these fashions as maybe some kind of inspiration for your own fashion? No. <laughs> right? Right? <laughs> for fun. For fun. I mean, Tessa, listen, you're prolific on social media. I know this is also all over your feed. Do you look at that and go, mm, I'm going to take notes. I'm going to wear that on Saturday night. <laughs> Do you know, it has become more about the fashion scene and being seen than the music, mm. really. But I admire that in a way because, you know, where else can you wear some of those trends? Where else can you just express yourself in that way, feeling so free and liberated? Uh, you know, you kind of have to embrace that. Yeah, it's true. I mean, I think it's fun, it's pageantry, it's like, it, it kind of feels like, though, to me, it doesn't really know what it is. Like, it's not like a fan expo where everybody gets dressed up in, like, cosplay and they dress up like their favorite character. And it's not like your traditional traditional kind of like Woodstock inspired hippie festival either. I think it started out kind of trying to be that way. Um, it's an identity crisis. It's called an identity <laughs> crisis a little bit. I think we're feeling it. And I mean, I, for me, I know I grew up like in the 90s, I was like a super neo hippie and I went to a lot of like festivals and, you know, wandered around and all my clothes were from like thrift stores. Like, I don't know what that is. Right there, I'm wearing an actual curtain, like a piece of fabric and I've wrapped it around myself. I probably picked it up off the floor oh, of a thrift store. It probably cost me a dollar. So uh, what I find interesting about Coachella, which I think when it started out was very much hippie inspired, there, there are now people wandering around. Like there's this girl who's wearing like a Gucci, um, um, fanny pack, like her outfit probably costs more than your entire wardrobe, my entire wardrobe. Like she's like, th this now has become branded, it's become elitist. And I feel like in that way, it's a little bit disingenuous. Like you're not this free love, like whatever, hang out in the field. You're like, a, you're about corporate representation. I think that's a bit gross at times. Mm. I would wear that. I, I was gonna say I would never wear festival fashion. Then I saw that fanny pack and I was like, oh, I would wear that. So I guess <laughs> I have to change my whole argument completely. because I. I don't want to shop at like a, a what, where did you shop? The vintage store? Yes. I don't want to shop. I don't want to <laughs> buy clothes with other people's sweat on them. Like I, so, but it's even still in the act of doing that, it's not like at Woodstock, which, which is what you mentioned. That was what people I wasn't were... at Woodstock for the record. <laughs> I, I'm not that old. Okay, but yes. I, 
at Woodstock, people weren't going shopping for what they wore to Woodstock. Mm -hmm. That was just their wardrobe. Like, you were still going shopping no, no, to no. go to the festival I wasn't. or shop I wore that. Own... I wore that stuff to my job. I wore that out in public. I did. <laughs> I legit wore it out in public. You don't shame me, but I like <laughs> the way I looked. But I think you point to it. It is the commercialization of this. I don't know if most people even realize that it's a music festival. Like, people are looking through their Instagram feed going, oh my gosh, look at the fashions. I think it is a fashion show. There happens to be a music festival happening at this fashion show, but this is the whole point. <laughs> Coachella, it's a fashion show. It's not a music festival. I mean, until Beyonce hits the stage, but beyond, beyond that, it's really about the fashion. And when you talk about the commercialization of it, most people like us aren't there in California. Because we can't afford to go. Correct. I mean, that or we're physically far away from I it. don't want to go. Do you want to go? Well, I kind of want to go, but <laughs> my point is this. When you actually then realize this is made for social media, you guys. It's not made for you to go. It's made so that you envy on your silly feed, going, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. So when you're thinking of it that way, you have to make a splash with your fashion. If you're not a success on social media at this festival, you're not a success. Case in point, Nicki Minaj. This is how you do festival fashion if you're going to do it. Now, you can't, we can't show the front, because there's a lot of Nicki Minaj <laughs> in the front that we can't show you on daytime TV. But I looked at it, and I said, OK, would I wear this? I can't. But would I do a version of this? Absolutely, I would. Thank you, Nikki. She's got a face chain going on. I don't know if you guys have ever seen those before. She's got tassel extras in her hair, which might be a belt. And all this to say, that is how you make a splash on social media. It's not about the music. Right. It is only about the fashion. Mm. Right? I don't know. I don't know. Hey, uh, this is a big thing. This is already tearing up online, so we want to hear what you think about it. What would you do for extra credits at school? Okay, so think about that, because there's a piece in the Washington Post, and one philosophy professor believes there's a lot to be learned from dating. And apparently the act of asking someone out and then having a conversation with them in person over a cup of joe, for example, just isn't something that young people do anymore. So the date is being replaced with random hookups. So this prof is saying, hey, if you go out with someone face-to-face, -face, no alcohol involved, then I will give you an extra credit in your philosophy class with me. Yeah? 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 Tessa? What do you think of this? It's such an interesting concept, you know? In, on one hand, I kind of appreciate that that's what we're missing, you know? We're missing that human contact and that ability to connect with someone. And, you know, even the development of children's brains, you can text and you can edit and you can pause, and we're missing that. It's not developing the same way, that part of your brain that is instantaneous and, and in the moment. So I kind of understand as a skill set uh, working on that. Would you want a professor saying, Tessa, well, here's an extra credit you can get. You go out and figure out how to go out on a date with somebody <laughs> and come back and report back to me this professor. Like, would you appreciate that? I think as a personal quest, that might be something to pursue, but it's also not a controlled environment. You don't know what you're setting yourself up for. I, well, I, I yeah, <laughs> and it's, it's also you're doing it like, you're doing it and the other person that you're asking out, they don't know if you're doing it for extra credit or if you're actually interested in that. Yeah. So right. I, right? That's, it's nefarious at, at, at its outset. And dare I say, highly intrusive. This is a philosophy professor. I'm not taking a dating course. So get your nose out of my romantic life. So if a prop is telling me, if you want extra credit, go and do this, I think you are crossing all kinds of lines of uh, propriety. If a teacher is telling you what to do in your romantic life, that's up for me to determine, not you. And number two, I feel like she's also passing judgment. Like, I hear totally what you said, Tessa, that we are missing interpersonal connection the way we used to. On the flip side, is that a bad thing in your early 20s? We live now longer than ever. We are getting married later because we are having our education. We, you know, we luckily health is on our side, we hope. So what is wrong if you're hooking up in your early 20s? I don't know why she's passing judgment on these 20 year olds. People are still falling in love and getting married. Somehow it's still working. Right. So I don't know that she, her putting her nose in to pass judgment on hookup culture is her place. Well, Tessa, okay, you, I feel like you're closer to your dating. Like, we haven't been out in the dating field for a long time, a long time. <laughs> I really but I do. to any athlete about that, though, really. There's no time. Right, because you, you don't get the chance right. to. But do you feel like when you're hearing from friends, are they feeling like this is a thing? Because sometimes I feel like this is something that people who are, have been long out of their dating look back and they're like, oh, you're not doing it right. 
Do you yeah, feel like your friends are suffering? I guess I, maybe that's, you know, my stance on this is a little different because I am an old soul and I think I can't relate to those that are doing it on the apps and connecting yeah. that way. And so I love that idea of really nurturing a human connection and I think that's what we're missing. Maybe, yeah. maybe it, it doesn't need to be in this forum. You know, right. maybe it doesn't need to be dictated by a professor. But I think it is something to pursue personally. Mm -hmm. I like that idea, too. I actually think that's, that's true. I just feel like with this professor, it's something slightly, like, I don't know, uh, patronizing or yes. voyeuristic. Yes, slope, for and, sure. And she actually... What do, would the follow-up be? Like, are you how getting... How do you prove it? No, but is, is your professor saying to you, so did you kiss? Well, here's the thing. She's like, got, see? It's so all right. She's that's got a icky. YouTube channel. This woman, she's got a YouTube channel, and there is a religious kind of undertone to it. She's somebody who is very much Christian. She she has, obviously, you can make some assumptions there that, that her philosophy is that the ideal route is when you're dating, that is eventually you get to, um, you know, dating for a while in marriage. Oh. And there's nothing wrong with that, but that's not everyone's path to happiness. And I think what we're learning from, I think, millennials is that they are carving out new directions. Yeah. And they're saying, I may not want to go down this road. I may not want to be even in a monogamous partnership. I may want to have uh, a, no partners. partner. I might want to, like, knock myself <laughs> up one day. Like, I might want to do all kinds of different things mm -hmm. that mainly doesn't align with this. Having said that I do think there is something actually I think it should happen in high school I think we should talk about relationships what relationships could look like what maybe would work for you that might not work for you and all the possibilities that are out there I just don't feel like this university professor you don't uh, like... not when I'm paying you uh, thousands of dollars into there you go teach me Socrates <laughs> thanks very much we'll be right back we'll be right back after this break entire show that is what social media is made for so get chatting with us who is the rightful owner of a pet is it the person who cares for the pet or the person who paid for the pet okay think about that it's gonna go both ways it's being reported that a judge in Florida thinks it is both and granted a dog's caretaker part ownership so apparently the dog was bought and licensed to one person but then the former neighbor decided he wanted to own the dog. He sued for sole ownership, claiming that since he pays for its food, its toys, and its vet bills, it should be his dog. The judge decided the dog belongs to both parties, the owner and the guy who took care of the dog. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Ladies, this is already blowing up online, but I this morning we were talking about this in our morning meeting, and I said, there's something missing. Oh, there's details missing. Why are you guys fighting over the dog? There was one line in the story that made me realize, I think there was some kind of relationship uh -huh. between the dog owner and the guy who was caretaking. And I think that the dog is sadly being used as a pawn. So the guy who was caretaker, who only took care of the dog for five weeks, I mean, that's not a short time, but it's not a long time yeah. to fall in love with the dog so bad that you want sole custody. Something feels off to me. But then the story was that the woman who owned the dog, she used to care for this man. He's a Vietnam vet. He had lung cancer surgery. She was caretaking him for a while. Oh. And I think maybe That's there weird. are feelings that Layer. got shared. The and Layer. so wow. the dog became the vessel for his love for the woman. And so what has now <laughs> happened is if she moves away with the dog, He'll never see them again. So what does he do? He sues for custody of the dog to ensure he continues to see the woman. Boom. Oh. <laughs> Boom. That's Got it figured out. It ain't wow. about the dog. <laughs> it's not about the dog. The poor judge, right? The poor judge was probably like that day, like just in the court going like, my God, really? <laughs> the dog custody? I don't know. It's, and it's the same with children though. Like don't ch parents of children, if you're not, uh, like if you haven't broken up in a healthy, amicable way, the children obviously sure. get caught in the crossfire. Or expecting a babysitter or a nanny to have that kind of, you know, agreement. I think you know what you get into when you decide to be a caretaker yes. and, and unless that's mutually decided and talked about to share custody and to share ownership, that's tough. Although maybe she should have been ch chipping in to pay for the, the bills and I the know, food. I know, what kind and of a dog owner? Yeah. 
she was the dog owner, so she owns the dog, but she was allowing somebody else to buy food for her own dog. As okay. a vet bills? As a dog owner myself, two dogs, I would never expect a neighbor to look after my, or uh, to pay for my dogs for me and take my dogs to the vet and pay for the vet bill. I, I, like it would be, I would be very, very irresponsible. I don't know why you have a dog if you're expecting some other person to take care of it all the time. Yeah. I, I don't know, I'm, I'm torn in this situation. Not, this specific situation, <laughs> given that you've already like talked about the nuances, but in a regular situation where there's not maybe exploitation mm -hmm. happening yeah. and a lingering romantic uh, yearning, mm -hmm. I would, I don't feel that dogs are necessarily property. I do think that- Which the, is how they are viewed in the eyes I of the law. I yeah. understand. I do think that the judge in a certain situation made the right call. You know why? Because dogs get attached to people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so for five weeks, He's been going over to the vet's house and having fun, and when you rip that person out of the dog's life, that's really sad to me. The judge understood that. Well, judge Judy had an episode of this. It was really good. <laughs> anyway, Judge Judy made the same call, kind of like a both, you, you know, take the caregiver and the owner sort of were given equal acknowledgement. It's funny that you say that it's for the, you were thinking that the judge, judge was thinking of the dog, because the judge in her ruling actually said it's because of the health benefits that the dog is giving both people which I thought was very interesting. If, you, if someone's recovering from anything, if you're either a war vet or he had lung cancer surgery, the dog was clearly giving him a, a health boost. Yeah. And, but the judge also said that it was also giving the woman, the original owner, a health boost. Interesting. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. April on Facebook wrote us and said, this happened with my neighbor's cat. The, par the, parents, the parents moved away and didn't notice that it had moved into our house. The parents came back one summer and got mad at us for stealing their cat. Sorry, it's better off with us. Well, April, I'm glad you shared a story about a cat because I have a, a story that relates. And I mean, at sometimes it raises the question of like, does the pet choose who they want to be with? Because I'll tell you this, my cat, Sally Hot Dog, we were doing renovations on our house. This cat wandered in, as I've shared before. He sat down on a, a, a ladder and started watching Jason work on the house. And Jason texted me and he's like, there's a cat that's coming. The cat left, would go away, would come back repeatedly. And we heard the word on the street was that the cat had belonged to somebody. We didn't know who, a neighbor, that wasn't very good to him. I don't know if this is true or not. No collar. No collar. Okay. Eventually, one day, Sally Hot Dog came inside and he had hurt his paw. He was crying, he came to us, he was crying. We brought him to the vet because we were very concerned. And at that point they said, your cat is, this cat is not fixed. This cat has no chip. If we want to fix his paw while he's out, you might as well get him chipped. He's your cat now. So if I, one day, this person had come and knocked on my door and said, give us back Sally Hot Dog or Simba or whatever they called him. I don't know what they <laughs> called him. I would have said, forget about it. This cat chose us. Sometimes the pet chooses the owner. Mm. Bam, yeah. that's all I got to say. Go there. Go there. Well, this next thing is so fun. Can you predict what the future holds? Well, there could be some brand new social swag in your future. We want to tell you about this. The Social is proud to be joining forces with the Play the Future app so that you can make predictions about awesome stuff that hasn't even happened on the show yet, all while watching our shows. So it is like playing trivia, but in the future. So I wanna show you how this works to invite you in to play along with us. I'm gonna pull it up on my iPad right now. So what happens is when you actually pull this up and you open up the app, the Play the Future app, which is what we're looking at, it'll come up with a question. Today's question is, for example, Tessa Virtue takes over TV. There's a little skate, that's cute. How many times will hashtag Tessa takes over CTV be tweeted today? So you see it asks a question in the future and then you can actually give your own prediction. This time it's in the form of a number. Would you like any guesses, Tessa? How many times? I'm just hoping a couple times. <laughs> <laughs> probably, I posted those, so. <laughs> so uh, what you can do is predict, okay, how many times is this gonna happen? Kay. If you think, oh, well, I wonder what everybody else is thinking. If you take a look, there's hints. So first First hint, it says number of tweets. As of Friday, people were guessing, oh, about 311. Okay. Second hint, if you unlock it, if you press it, it unlocks. So do you want to use a key to have uh, unlock this uh, hint? You have three keys left, unlock. So as of Saturday, someone uh, they were looking at an average of 192. So I'm going to make a prediction. Ladies, would you like to weigh in on this? How many times will hashtag takes over, Tessa takes over CTV be tweeted today? Do you figure? I'm going to make a prediction. 
Press. Do, do we have to make the same prediction? No, whatever. Let's okay. let's pick one and we'll all consensus. Let's put our heads together. Let's put our heads together. Heads together. Something. I'm gonna say 517. 17 is a lucky number. 517. 517? Yes. Sounds I feel like good. we can only be disappointed by this. <laughs> <laughs> you are like Tessa Virtue <laughs> and Canada is watching. Let's get so, it going. Okay, let's go. go I'm gonna make a prediction. 517, submit prediction, okay. confirm, yes. So now what's gonna happen here is now you just have to sit back and wait for everything to unfold over the next 24, 48, or 72 hour time frame. So what is in this for you? It depends how accurate your predictions are because the closer you get, you will accumulate points. If you are the closest, you will win this week anyway, a social, some of the social swag, this mug. Now you think, oh, a mug, right? <laughs> These are in such short supply. These are not even actually ours. They stay on set. Yep. I don't have one. We don't even have them. I don't them. have one. No. We don't have them. That is how <laughs> rare these are. <laughs> I won't tell. So <laughs> if you do fancy yourself a budding fortune teller or a loyal fan of the show, download this app today. It's a ton of fun, and the questions change day to day to day. All right, well, that was fun. Stay tuned. We'll see what the future holds. We'll be right back on the other side of the show. <laughs> the break. Welcome back, everyone. Okay, so after university, our next guest set an ambitious goal for himself. He wanted to be an Olympic rower despite never having tried the sport. Here to tell us more about his journey, please welcome the man behind the new book, The Four-Year Olympian, Jeremiah Brown. Hey, hey. hey. Welcome to the show. Thank Welcome you very to much, the show. Uh, you're an athlete. This is a book about your athletic life, but we're actually going to start with the personal, which you also get into pretty deeply yeah. in this story as well. So we want to go back to when you were a football player, McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario, and then two weeks into your second year, your girlfriend said, "Surprise, I'm pregnant." <laughs> this changed a lot of yes. things. What was your reaction to the news? Uh, 19 years old, realizing I'm going to be a father. Um, it was like sort of a vortex of all my future dreams kind of colliding and correcting and <laughs> vanishing sometimes. Mm. And just thinking, wow, this is going to be the hardest thing I've done yet in my life. Um, but I think uh, when you're in that situation, it tests your character. And I think uh, I was lucky that Ethan's mom, Amy, is, is so great. And we both said, you know, we're going to do this and we're going to do it right. And you did. And so your son, Ethan, was born, and you graduated school. And um, I'm curious to know, all of a sudden, you're going from being this football player. Where does this idea of becoming a rower come from when you've never even run before? You, you set this goal. I'm going to win the Olympics. I've never done it before. What, what, tell, explain how this happened. Well, in the time that we have, <laughs> I had my son. I had finished my degree. And I remember thinking, you know, is the rest of my life going to be predictable? Is it a nine to five, a mortgage, car payments, more kids? And to me, that, I, I'm, I'm very goal oriented. That was just, it was crushing. And I wanted to do, I still felt like I had more potential as an athlete. So I remember watching the guys in 2008 actually win the gold medal for Canada. It was in summer. I was in my parents' basement, just lying on the couch, lazy, stuffing my face with ketchup chips. <laughs> and I was watching them sing on the podium when they, when they won the medal, I thought, those guys look like me. You know, they've got long arms and legs. I'm going to go do that. That's my ticket. Wow. It's been That's how it started. Anything but predictable, that's for sure. You moved from Coburg to Victoria to train with the men's national team. Yeah. Physically, what was that training like? Rowing is probably the hardest sport in the world. No offense. Figure skating is really hard. <laughs> Stay with <laughs> uh, we'll let that sit. You know, <laughs> rowing, I mean, the best way I can describe it is if you got, it's like sprinting down a, four, a hundred meters straight away and then you get tired and you want to stop, but you got to keep going for another five minutes and put dumbbells in your hands. It's a full body assault. Um, it's just a, a brutal attack on the body. When you watch it on TV, it looks elegant. You know, when the guys and the girls are doing it at the highest level, it looks, looks flowing and it looks beautiful, but Actually, the body is like shutting down in the last stages of the race. Wow. OK, so what's it like, though? Because previously, you played football. You had no experience with rowing. You walk into, I don't know, the locker room or onto the river, or I don't know, whatever, and you show up, <laughs> and these other people have been doing it their whole lives, and you're just like, I'm going to do what you do. What was the reaction? Did they say, hey, come in the boat? Or 
No. You know, ex <laughs> yeah, exactly. How did that work? Well, the reaction is a cold shoulder, which is what you should expect. I mean, you don't earn people's respect by showing up. So um, they didn't really talk to me or befriend me in any kind of team way way until I started beating them on the water a couple times here mm -hmm. and there. And, uh, you know, once I proved myself as an athlete that I was going to contribute to this crew, that's, that's when the bonds began to form. Mm. But at first it was like, you know, who's this chump? Who's this guy? <laughs> what does he think he's gonna do here? Mm -hmm. And I remember Malcolm Howard, one of my teammates, he said that, you know, Jerry came on onto the team, respected nobody. And inside I was incredibly in awe of these Olympians, but I just thought I'm not gonna show them that I'm in awe of them because I wanna have every edge that I, that I can. So secretly I was like, wow, these guys are Olympic medalists, mm. Olympic champions, some of them. But I wasn't gonna let on to that. Mm. So you're in Victoria and you're training, and meanwhile, um, you have this partner and this baby, this child, yes. and you're probably missing them. And they actually came out to Victoria to see you. So how, what was happening in your relationship at this time? So Amy West, my son's mother, I just wanna look at the screen and say, thank you. <laughs> she Aww. was absolutely incredible. And she moved across the country, basically for my dream. And our relationship unraveled uh, during that time. And I remember the morning where my son and Amy drove away that first time, we'd all been living in a small 500 square foot condo. And, the, and she drove away the first time she was gonna live separately. And my son in the back seat crying and crying. And I just, my heart just wow. broke in a million pieces as I say in the book. And I, after, after that happened, I went to Amy and I said, look, I need you um, if I'm gonna do this. And I need, we need to keep our family together, even if platonically for the next two and a half years to see this through. And you know, God bless her, she said yes. She said, I'm gonna support you. And she was my number one pillar of support in terms of my personal life through Amy. that whole journey. Wow. So, thank you, Amy. That's huge. That's huge. Wow. So, I mean, it's called the four-year Olympian, so I guess we're not, um, you know, it's no spoilers here. You did make the national team. You did accomplish your goal of getting to the Olympics, competing at the London 2012 Games with the Canadian men's eights. Not only that, you walked away with a silver medal at the Olympics. So there you are with the team. You had, you went from setting that goal in your parents' basement with the ketchup chips. So what did it actually feel like when you actually were on the podium with a medal? Well, uh, as my faculties came back, you know, at the end of the race, like you're seeing little swirling galaxies in your vision, your body shutting down. So. When, it, when my body recovered, it was just euphoria, just rolling over me again and again, this realization that, wow, finally, you know, we were, we had done it as, as a team, we were Olympians, you know. Until you become an Olympian, right until you cross that finish line or your competition is finally over for the first time, you're just, you're just trying to get there and to, and to finally cross the line was just euphoric, just unbelievable feeling of, of relief and, and we'd finally done it. Okay, but then it's time to celebrate, and you write in your book that you partied really, really hard afterwards in London to the point where, I don't know, maybe you were in a casino or something. Like, did you put your silver medal on the roulette table at one point? Like, you bet your yes. medal? First of all, did you lose it? Yeah. <laughs> And secondly, I love this story because I'm a gambler too, a little bit. Okay. And also it shows me your personality because you know we see athletes, like track and field athletes, figure skating athletes, we see their personalities. Rowers, I have no idea what a rower's personality is. So how come, like, <laughs> yeah, I'm not gonna lie. I don't know, yeah, I, I can't do <laughs> this. Let's do difficult sports why in the world, it, that's why fine. Is it, yeah. Why is rowing such sort of like blank for personality? No offense well. to rowers, but I mean. <laughs> First of all, yes, there was a lapse in judgment. Okay. And I did try to bet my silver medal on red and roulette. And luckily I had, we had formed a posse with some British locals and they convinced me to take it off the table. Phew, phew, phew. Um, but rowers have a lot of personality. The thing is, because rowing is so hard on the body and, and mentally and physically, you're, pre you're preparing for pain, really, is okay. what's happening. So when you see us on TV, you see us galvanizing ourselves, stealing ourselves for the effort that's coming. And so it's, uh, you know, it really covers up everything that we are, which is a whole bunch of personality. Aww. Now I know you like hanging out at casino, so yeah, we will go. <laughs> I'll bring 20 bucks when we lose, that's it. <laughs>
Can I come with my medals? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I've got some to spare. She's got a lot. <laughs> Jeremiah, you now oversee a fantastic program called Game Plan, which is a wellness and transition program for Olympians, Paralympians, and national team athletes. How has that transition been for you from sport to real life? Uh, and you know, because <laughs> you're going through it too, but it's, it's challenging. I think for athletes, the biggest thing is the relativity of it. There's this chasm between experiencing this, uh, this goal that you've chased sometimes for 10 years, your whole life, uh, a little different in my situation, but it's that, that peak human experience that's hard to move on from. So uh, when you're coming out of that, it's a question of identity, I think, you know, and who am I now? And uh, this program, what we're trying to do is help athletes cultivate more sides of themselves than just, I am this athlete here to perform. Um, you know, what is your education plan? What is your career plan? You know, what are the skills you need to develop? Um, and even friends and family, who are you outside of being an athlete? So this is what we're trying to do with the programs, encourage more of that. And congratulations with that. And thank you for spending some time with us here today. Two Olympians on our couch. Two. Oh. Let's remind you that the book is called The Four-Year Olympian. Make sure you grab yourself a copy. But everyone here in our studio audience, you're getting yours today. Tessa, thank you for joining our panel today. You are a blast. What thank a pleasure. You. Thanks for having thank me. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Hey, yeah. It's Tessa Virtue, I know. Hey, on the next episode of The Social, the domestic goddess Nigella Lawson is here, and also who's going to be sitting down as our fifth chair from W5. We've got the one, the only, Kevin Newman. Hope to see you then. Take care, everybody. <laughs>